Welcome back to this week's equipping class here at River Oaks Community Church. It's the second of two in the month of June on the subject of grief. Last week, we had Danny and Jenny Parrish share with us their experiences with Grief Share Ministry, as well as their personal testimonies. And then, of course, on May 29th, we had a wonderful sermon on biblical processing of grief from Pastor Sonny Flowers. I'd encourage you to take a look at both of those and then think about this week's as a progression uh, in that processing of grief. As we hear from Sue Glad, who is currently continuing to walk through grief over this past year, she's gonna share with us some of the ways that she has been encouraged by others, but also how she has been encouraged by God, particularly through the book of Ruth and the individual of Naomi. She has been filled where there has been emptiness and she has been finding vision in her own valley. And so we do pray that this will be a helpful session for each of you and uh, that you would be able to share this with others as well. So now let's join Sue in progress as she takes us on the journey from empty. To talk about my journey in the past year and a half, well, actually a year and three months. My journey alongside of Naomi's from the Bible in the book of Ruth. Uh, first, a nod to those who've come before me. From Sonny's message, how do I find healing on my journey of grief? From his six points, uh, first turning to God with my broken heart and establishing a new identity stood out to me personally along with there's no timeline, because there isn't. From the very long list of symptoms that he gave us, I have experienced the loss of identity, flashbacks, insomnia, staying busy for the sake of staying busy, wanting to rush to get to the next thing, and the awareness that I'm alone. Mornings and evenings are the most difficult, but I must say the evenings are the most. In the morning, I spend time with God, and in the evening, I listen to the Bible in a year from my YouVersion Bible uh, podcast on my phone, and I fall asleep with a prayer and the words of, of the podcast on the, of the Bible, uh, only, of course, to wake up two or three times in the night and wonder how much longer before I can get up. <laughs> we heard from Jenny and Danny and the good things they had to say about grief share. I was impressed with how they both sought out community to help find comfort until they were able to help others themselves. And for 2 Corinthians 1.3 is the verse that Jenny quoted, uh, a powerful verse, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. And I think that's, we, we read, this is the point of our suffering, is to one day be able to offer comfort to those who need it. The testimony of their own losses made everything they said powerful. I was struck with how different their losses were. Jenny's brief marriage shattered in the gas stove explosion on the mission field in Guatemala, and Danny's suffering to see his wife succumb to cancer for all those years or over many years. These were their empty places. From the book of beginnings, God fills empty places. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the earth was formless and fo empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God shows up to fill empty earth with his divine presence. It comforts me that God promises to fill empty places in our loss, whatever our loss is. The deeper the loss, the greater the need for that hope and future that Jeremiah 29, 11 talks about. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And another translation says disaster, not to bring you disaster. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And yet when we're empty, we feel that we have suffered disaster. It's a very common experience. Grief involves the feeling of empty. I'm indebted to Nancy Guthrie. In her Bible study, God does his best work with empty, in which she points out how Old and New Testament narratives show how God fills what is empty. I chose one case in point, the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, this personal romantic narrative, is a story of order and peace in the lives of one family that stands in stark contrast to the chaotic and violent book of Judges that comes right before Ruth. Israel, in the book of Judges, forsakes the true God to serve idols. And every man is doing what is right in his own eyes, and the judges that are there blunder badly. Now Ruth, the Gentile from Moab, turns her reckless culture on its head to turn from her past and her gods to serve the only true God of the Israelites, of Naomi and Elimelech and her sons. She claims a new identity in the name of the Almighty God and ultimately bears a baby, Obed who will become the grandfather of David in the line of Jesus Christ. Obviously, she didn't know that. She is indeed heroic in her helping and serving Naomi throughout. She deserves to bear the name of the book, the book of Ruth. But I believe the book could have been called the book of Naomi. I believe the entire narrative turns on this character, her need, her emptiness. Early in life, Naomi experienced one loss after another after beginning with leaving her family in Bethlehem to go with her husband, Limelech, to Moab to escape famine. Somehow, the sojourn became permanent, lasting years. Her sons, Malon and Chilion, married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth, not exactly bragging rights in Bethlehem for them to have married these girls from Moab. Historically, Moab had been an enemy of Israel and oppressed them for years and years. In the book of Judges, Ehud oppressed them until God raised a deliverer. Three books of the Bible and Psalms, Isaiah, and Jeremiah denounce Moab and prophesy their judgment. This is Ruth's heritage. This is her home. And this is the time of the narrative of the book of Ruth. For unexplained reasons, Naomi lost her husband and her sons over the course of time, not, not at all once it appears, but in doing so, she would have lost hope for her support, hope of grandchildren. There are no children mentioned in her family, shared family dinners, shared family fortunes, sweet times of just being together to make memories. No doubt she saw her life over. Good memories relegated to the past. No doubt her daughters-in-law became extra baggage, reminders of what she had lost. We only see a sliver of the depth of relationship when we read of their anguish in leaving her when she sorrowfully entreats them to leave to, to leave to return to her their mother's home so they can remarry. And she says, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And she loves short books of the Bible, only four chapters in Ruth. They say they would rather go back with her in verse 10, but it doesn't take much to persuade Orpah to hustle on back to her mother's house. Not for Ruth. 
she clings to Naomi and her iconic words in verses 16 and 17 speak to their profound bond. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people, my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I die. And there I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if death, even death, separates you and me. When they arrive in Bethlehem, the house of bread, she tells, Naomi tells, everyone to call her Mara, bitter, because God has afflicted her with sorrow, bringing her back empty after she had left full. They had left because of famine. They were not full. But in Naomi's mind, because she had her family, it did not matter how much stuff or even how much food they had in their homes. She recognized that she was full at that time. And whether it was a mistake or not for them to leave and go to Moab during the time of famine in Bethlehem, who knows? But God is sovereign over the big and the little, and she comes back with Ruth. She blamed God. Naomi blamed God, not, her, not the circumstances or evil forces. Somehow she knew God was sovereign over sorrow and over blessing, over good and over bad, over good and evil even. God is sovereign. I remember when Kevin went to see, a, uh, had a, his first blood test PSA after many years and and when he came back and when we found out that his PSA was, was soaring high, he said, you know, the last physical exam I went to, the doctor never even tested my PSA. If he, if he had caught it then, I would not be in this situation. Um, you know, crying over spilt milk. It was over. It was like, we, we trust that God is sovereign even over that mishappenstance. Empty is exactly the word to describe losing someone you love. Whether the departure is abrupt or the tortuous end of a long illness, empty is empty. Bitterness may be a, may be a part of our experience, may not, but I know it's tall green cousin named Envy who rises up to notice how full other people's busy lives are, busy families and marriages, and makes you feel exhausted, deflated, sad, physically weak, unmotivated. I felt these things. On March 19, 2021, after almost 48 years of marriage, I lost my husband, my beloved husband, Kevin Ingram Glad. Born February the 7th, 1952, almost two years younger than I, big man in stature and personality and character and faith. He filled every room he walked into. He was loud, talked with his hands, perennial jokester. He was not quiet and gentle like me. <laughs> and if he didn't turn you off, he completely won you over. His heart was as big as the ocean, and he possessed the rare skill to include everything, everyone he was around in personal conversation with him and include everybody around them while he retained the status as the life of the party, of course. He filled every fiber of my life. I grew up after I got married. I learned to enjoy many things I would never have imagined or even wanted in the short life of 22 years before getting married. Uh, snow skiing, jet skiing, motorcycles, hunting, shooting guns, golfing. I did that. 
<laughs> when I say learned, I mean I was instructed. I was instructed and tried it at least once. But hey, it was fun. Sometimes a couple of times. I have one of those uh, activities left, and I hope I can remember how to golf now. <laughs> what more could you experience? 12 years of youth ministries in three states, traveling to or through 49 states of the United States, Alaska being the last one on our list, which we did not make. The one activity that I will miss and am missing is his love for music, all kinds of music, uh, lots of Christian music, hymns, uh, creative uh, arrangements, but he made sure that we had the best sound system in any house that we lived, even if it was a humble home, it reverberated with sound. And if you've been in our home, you know how it can reverberate. <laughs> he was a musician, uh, definitely the musician. He uh, played music, he sang, he was a fabulous singer. And then he, uh, in later years, took up the guitar. And I just loved hearing him play. I just wanted him to practice. Even the dogs would lie down and just be calm when he was playing. And it was just, uh, it was just a beautiful time. Between Kevin's death in March and mid-August, only five months later, I gave away our two beloved English setters, sold our beautiful home, on the advice of getting, after getting some good counsel and moved in with my son and family for the next eight months. They welcomed me into their home and I took them up on it. Um, what a blessing. And I'm, I'm so grateful for those eight months to be with their children and with them and to be able to cook and clean and work myself to death. No. <laughs> I received a flood of cards, phone calls, visits, favors, incredible outpouring of love from, from our church, from all of you. I, I dutifully read the books I was given, and they assured me that this journey is bumpy, and that's okay. Wright's book on recovering from your losses was personal and practical, and, and that was the main message that, that I got from it, that it was going to take whatever time it was going to take. This is the first time in my life I've ever lived alone. I had seen myself in our marriage uh, as a saint and Kevin as the sinner. <laughs> Most of the time. Well, I knew I wasn't perfect, and sometimes I, I, I really needed, and I knew I, I had to apologize. But honestly, since he's been gone, I see my sin. I see more of my sin now than I ever have. And I thank God for that. Because now I know how much I need Jesus. More than ever. I think the reverse is actually true, that he protected me from myself and even my own proclivity to sin. I am indeed grateful. So does the empty feeling ever go away? The course of love never did run smooth, nor is the course of grief. It is definitely bumpy, uncertain, long, and very individual. God is the only one capable of filling up empty places of grief. This was the messages we've heard before mine, and it's true. God fills empty places. Thank God. It's true. Behind the characters of Naomi and Ruth, in all their emptiness, stands the awesome character of Boaz, kinsman redeemer, who steps into the scene as provider of grain for the widow and the daughter-in-law, he makes sure copious amounts of grain are conveniently left for Ruth as she gleans in his fields. How convenient that they would find his field full. His generous hand extended more than enough barley grain for Ruth and Naomi. 
And he says to Ruth, these six measures of barley, or I'm sorry, Ruth said, these six measures of barley he gave me. For he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty handed. I must admit that at the outset of Kevin's death and the funeral, etc., that food came to me so abundantly, I, I didn't think I was going to have room for it, even with a second refrigerator. I, I definitely I had more than enough. I can't thank our church family enough for all of their provisions for my family and me and friends in those, in those days. Uh, our church is beyond generous. And I must say a word about how supported and uplifted I felt with Sonny's guidance and uh, David Beatty's very present prayer presence for Kevin and me through all the years we'd been at the church and knew that he was declining with cancer. And especially toward the end, uh, David's prayer presence was, was, uh, was a blessing and filled our hearts. The last time that David saw Kevin was Tuesday night, March 17th. And it was, uh, it was dusk and the, just only the sunlight coming from the windows were, provided the only light. And when David prayed for him, he put his hands on him as um, Kevin was sitting up actually. And he, uh, he prayed the Psalms over him. And he prayed long. And he prayed comfort. And he kept praying. And finally, I thought, you know what? I'm going to peek. Because I knew these verses were from the Psalms. And somehow I knew he wasn't reading. He was quoting. And it was true. I thought, that... That man has covered my husband with the Psalms, the presence and peace of God. It was quite an experience. <laughs> Sonny and the staff lifted huge responsibilities off my shoulders for the funeral. They only asked what I wanted to happen, and then they made it happen. I felt like a guest. The service was a foretaste of heaven as our friends and family from nine states gathered together to feast from our lavish table. And we all came away full, full of love and fellowship. The grain came to me in the form of being part of the community of River Oaks Community Church. I was encouraged hugged, prayed for spontaneously and in small groups. I found solace in the embrace and prayers of widows more recent than myself. On the anniversary of his one year home going, I was invited to a luncheon where my friends shared their own special memories of Kevin. They let me shed tears and patiently let me say what I wanted to say, no matter how long it was going to take. And they let me cry. Sonny offered me uh, a look at grief share opportunities, even after several, uh, and, and they were open to me at that time. Although I've not participated now, I can see the value, more of the value, and of course the community of, of it being the shared experience is the valuable lesson, I think. I continu have continued to open cards. And one thing I wanted to say about cards and card giving and card receiving, I remember I could not open the cards when I got them. I had to let them lie there. And then I would just wait for the time when I could open them. And I did. And I thank God for every one and just was uh, comforted to know that I was loved in that way. To be given these cards, uh, so many of them. I have them, I have them in a box and they're 
they're in my living room and table and I am going to take them out and reread them as I, I read them probably twice in all, but now that time has passed, I, I'm still going to take another look because these people loved me at a time when I needed to be loved and reminded that they were there. God used Boaz to encourage and confirm God's work in, uh, in their lives. As he told Ruth, may the Lord reward your work and may your wages be full from the Lord, under whose wings you have come to find refuge. I'm, I'm glad we, we heard a message about work today. I recognize it every day. I can seek refuge in the shelter of God's wings. He's my God, my Savior, my husband. I'm trying to learn to lean into my grief. For your maker is your husband. This is Isaiah 54. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The etymology of the word husband is derived from the Old Norse for occupier and tiller of soil. Its verb form is till and cultivate to produce good things from the land. What a gift a husband is. What now? I know I need work. I need focus. I need to serve the Lord and others. Calligraphy has done that for me. It's been a means of work a gift and a burden as all work is. It offers enjoyment, diversion, opportunity for serving, but mainly, mainly, it offers me focus on Bible verses, one word at a time, one promise at a time, for me to find hope in the shelter of the Almighty. And when I set out to write a Bible verse, to script it, uh, decoratively, but I start with pencil and plain paper. And I write one word at a time. And then I, then I group the words according to the logical sense of phrasing. And group them so they're tightly bound together. So that I, and I have to go over that, that first draft, that first writing out to look at what the words are saying. Do they, do, are they grouped appropriately? Um, is there a way I can emphasize words that I need or that someone who has asked me to do something might need? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 Now that verse is easy to say, well, I can go snow skiing on the diamond slopes, <laughs> or I can do uh, you know, all these Olympic achievements, and I know I'd have to train for a little while, but still, really, if I can do all things for Christ, then through Christ, then that means all things, right? So when you look, and when I reread that Philippians, only four chapters, <laughs> um, that, that four, fourth chapter, Paul is talking about all the circumstances of hardship he's come through. Hardship, and then he says, I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. Oh, I can do this. I, the person that asked me to do this verse for them, to write it out, someone in our church, I stands alone at the top of the line, can do underneath. All things underneath, not bigger than can do, because can do is bold. I, at the top, is quite bold because we're talking about 
my life. I can do. And then all things is decorated. Just with a little bit of color, not much. But it's a little bit fancier, not much. But it's all things. Doesn't matter what it is. Through Christ. Through, it's kind of drawn out. No hurry to write the word. All capitals. Christ. It's very bold. Christ is the most bold word in the layout, but not in size, only in decoration. Who strengthens? Next line. Kind of spread out, just, just steady, steady, solid letters. Me. Last line. Almost as big as I in the first line, but decorated because God has seen me through. And now I know that I can do this. God offers rewards for anything we do in his name. I was glad when Sonny mentioned how Shirley Little found new work as a court advocate for the youth in Winston-Salem. This position was only attained after long hours of arduous study, difficult tests, interviews, to be a volunteer. What a new thing God is doing in this woman's life. Only eternity will tell. Boaz, as the kinsman redeemer for Ruth, who marries her and provides all things she and Naomi need for life. Whoa. He is a wonderful type of Jesus, the one who redeems our losses and fills emptiness. Once Ruth and Boaz have a baby boy, Naomi, guess what? Quits her complaining. She doesn't call herself Mara. She doesn't ask anybody else to say that that she's bitter. She becomes his nurse, uh, holds him in her arms, cradles him, and as she cradles him, she's cradling her future. She doesn't know, as well as Ruth, what will become of this child. She did not know he would become the grandfather of David, who is in the line of the promised Messiah. After chapter 3, when Naomi asks Ruth a question, how did it go, my daughter? Just a quick, oh, how did it go? Nothing cryptic or deep, profound. No more words are spoken or recorded from her. No complaints. She is embraced into a new family circle. Naomi's community of women rejoice with her and say, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. That's Boaz. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better than seven sons, has given him birth. Later, the, the women say, Naomi has a son. Naomi. Does she forget all about her husband? Does she forget her sons? I doubt it. I don't think so. Of course not. She's human. Just like Job couldn't have forgotten all this first family he ever had. But Naomi's life becomes focused on the future instead of her past. It is significant to note that Naomi's filling up and her joy did not come from her own efforts, her own womb, her own husband, her own sons. Her filling up is the result of the kinsman redeemer stepping into her life. Does God give widows and widowers the next mate? Oh, the Boaz I'm waiting for to fill up all my needs. 
or more grandchildren to fill? Any emptiness? Is this the point? I have six beautiful grandchildren, two of them just one mile from my house. I enjoy them. I miss the other four and can't wait to see them when I can. But are they my future and my hope? I have three strong adult sons who are busy with taking care of wives and children. They hold a presence in my life. Do I look to them to build me up, to hold me up, to meet my daily needs for comfort, strength, joy? Or is Jesus the only one who can do this, who can forge my future as my closest family member, my friend, closer than a brother or sister, my husband, the redeemer of my loss? We don't know how God fills empty places. We only know that he does through Jesus our kinsman redeemer, who is full of grace and truth, abundant in mercy, surprising in provision. I trust in the refuge of his wings. A couple days ago, I found a letter in a file drawer that was written probably in 1999 from one of my sons when he was in college. And I know that all three of my sons have had written similar letters to their dad, which I just didn't have my fingers on, couldn't get to. But I did find this one just two days ago. And he talks as he's thanking his dad. And on Father's Day, I think it's very appropriate just to Look at a, a few excerpts. It's rather short. He says, um, You've trained me to be a man, deal with my own problems while trying to help others. I attribute my success in life to your dedication to my brothers and me. Your whole life has been one of laboring for our family and trying to provide are the best for us. You work a ton of hours and have kept this up as long as I can remember. You're my role model. I see you studying hard for Sunday school class every Saturday night. Notice he put it off. I can attribute my study habits by seeing you give your best in search of the truth day in and day out. Your life has made my life possible. I wouldn't be sitting here writing this letter if it wasn't for your dedication. Thank you so much for giving your life for mine. The passage in Philippians chapter 2 comes to mind when I think of your willingness to give of yourself. I love you from the bottom of my heart. I try, to best, try my best to heed your words of wisdom for my life. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be called your son. That's something I can always be proud of. And then I looked up Philippians 1.20. And Paul says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that, with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. And then verse 21, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And I thought, how appropriate that he would share that verse in 1999 with my husband, who would be gone, in 2019. But I also thought how appropriate it is for me to read this verse because the point of the story is that the story goes on and that my prayer that in nothing I shall be ashamed, 
of the gospel and that with all boldness, as always. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. So, I thought I'd share that with you because it just seemed to fit. From the Valley of Vision, this is the last part, a collection of Puritan prayers. Lord, high and holy, meek and lowly, thou hast brought me to the valley of vision, where I live in the depths, but see thee in the heights. Hemmed in by mountains of sin, I behold thy glory. Let me learn by paradox that the way down is the way up, that the broken heart is the healed heart, that the contrite spirit is the rejoicing spirit, that the repenting soul is the victorious soul, that to have nothing is to possess all, that to bear the cross is to wear the crown, that to give is to receive, that the valley is the place of vision, Lord, in the daytime, stars can be seen from deepest wells, and the deeper the wells, the brighter thy stars shine. Let me find thy light in my darkness, thy life in my death, thy joy in my sorrow, thy grace in my sin, thy riches in my poverty, thy glory in my valley. May God be glorified. <laughs>